Welcome to the first History Major Career Night. Thank you all for coming out. This is an incredible turnout, and I'm so glad to see you all here, and I trust that you'll get a lot of useful information over the course of the evening. So, my name is Eric Jensen. I'm the Undergraduate Studies Director for the History Department, and I'm also the Honors Director, so I know a lot of you who are in the Honors Program already, and I know many of you who um, are or have been uh, in, in my classes. Uh, the point of, of this evening is to give you a lot of information about what kinds of jobs are available out there for history majors and how you can accentuate the particular skills you've gained as a history major in order to get those jobs uh, that are out there. And so my first uh, bit of information for you guys is that businesses, nonprofits, schools, the government, volunteer organizations all want history majors. Um, so please have confidence that your major is a marketable one and that your major is a very valuable one to uh, a lot of different organizations, institutions, and businesses out there. And I just wanted to give you uh, a quick list of some of the many companies and organizations that our recent history majors are currently working for. And this is just a list of some history majors, uh, current employers since 2010. We have Miami history majors working for the Congressional Quarterly, Fox Television, LaForce and Stevens, Kellogg's, the United States Congress, the Migration Policy Institute, Dow Jones, General Electric, First Colony Winery, Coach, the, the maker of handbags, Johnson & Johnson, Archer Daniels Midland, Northwestern University, the New University of Connecticut Institute of Latin American Studies, the New York City Metro System, the Council on Aging of Southwestern Ohio, Kimberly Clark, Northwestern Mutual, McKinsey & Company, not to mention high schools, law firms, the FBI, the State Department, uh, including overseas embassies, museums, tour companies. We'll hear from uh, two alums who are currently working for museums. Uh, and the list goes on. So be assured that you do have a marketable major. Um, if you didn't get, does anybody, uh, could somebody quickly just hold up the yellow sheet? So I, I photocopied a yellow sheet that, I, I call it my parental reassurance sheet. It basically is <laughs> um, kind of a list of articles from various journals like the New York Times, uh, Higher Education Online, that are written by business professors and employers that are saying employers out there want people with liberal arts degrees and, and particularly people with history degrees. And if there aren't enough, you can come and give me your email address afterwards and I can send it to you as an attachment. And on the back of that, I also listed um, the same list that I just read to you of the companies where many of our majors are currently working. So the way the evening will work is uh, we have a panel of uh, professors and history major alums up here who are going to talk about uh, some of their experiences or some possibilities for history majors. Um, once we're done talking, uh, we will turn it over to Mary Beth Barnes and Tyler Wade from Career Services who have done an awesome job in working with us in putting together this, um, this career evening for you guys. And they are a great resource that are always available uh, for all of you. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'll just introduce one by one um, some of the, the panelists up here. And once I've introduced them, I'll just hand over the microphone and they can talk to you about their particular area of expertise uh, or interest. So uh, I'm going to turn it over first to uh, Professor uh, Tatiana Sejas. Um, her specialty is Colonial Latin America and she wants to talk to you about the opportunities available out there in library sciences and, and um, information gathering, information technology. And your seat. Right. <laughs> Please ignore that I have my dog with me. Um, I'm still a very serious scholar. Um, so, I wanted to talk to you about the opportunities that are available in terms of going into library sciences. Um, a lot of our majors have ended up going to get a master's in library sciences, and I have helped them uh, work through their application processes and also getting them to be able to write the kind of personal statement that you need to be able to get into a master's program in library sciences. And one of the reasons why I was interested in doing this and have helped a lot of students do this is that I 
actually wanted to be a librarian when I was in college. Um, that was something that I envisioned for myself as a history major. Um, I wanted to be a librarian. So um, I got a job in a library when I graduated from college. And I did, I couldn't do library science work, but I did all kinds of other administrative work in libraries. And I spent my time talking to librarians and asking them about the kind of work that they did and what kind of degrees you needed to do that kind of work, right? And um, for me, it became really eye-opening in terms of the kind of administrative work that goes into maintaining a library. And it made me be able to make better choices about what I wanted to do. Um, so library sciences um, has a specialties, right? You can think about working at a university research library. Um, you can think about working at a municipal public library. Um, you can think about becoming an archivist, which is a special kind of librarian that uh, keeps uh, records that are in manuscripts, right, like not published. So all of this to say that you do need a master's to actually work as a librarian, but I think that many of your professors can help you uh, figure out like what schools you can apply to and also guide you in figuring out what librarians actually do. Because I was actually rather surprised when I went out there and worked for a research library um, in terms of how much of it is actually management and how much of it is really in finance uh, and in the kind of work that is really more akin to running an organization than it is uh, to say something like law or going into graduate school. So I think that for a lot of people it becomes a really incredibly rewarding uh, career. And we have a lot of history majors from Miami who have gone on to get their masters and to work in um, different library systems. Um, I have a student who is now working for the Dayton Public Libraries. I have another student who is now in graduate school at Indiana who is thinking of doing um, archival uh, librarianship. And, you know, the, the, the ways that you position yourself to do the kind of library work that you want to do, say, in like 10 years, um, is something that you kind of need a lot of advice for. So I, I want to put myself out there as somebody who's helped a lot of people go to graduate school for library sciences. And I can tell you a lot about what library work actually entails. Um, you know, I obviously made the decision to not become a librarian, right? I decided that I wanted to stick to history, which meant I decided to go to another 10 years of, <laughs> um, you know, getting a master's in history and getting a PhD in history. Um, but at that, that decision, that time commitment that I made to myself only came after I had explored this other possibility, which is something that I had kind of imagined myself doing. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's something that is a very uh, open possibility that I think a lot of students don't think about. We need a lot of librarians. There are a lot of public libraries across this country. And um, history majors are easily uh, the major that is most wanted in library sciences. Um, the way that now history is the best major to get into law school History is also the best major to get into a uh, program in library sciences. So that is, that is my little spiel about it. Um, everybody, um, you know, you guys can find me. I'm in 252 Upham. Um, and I really, and I say this very, very truthfully. If you are interested in this, please email me. And um, I'm really happy to make an appointment with you and talk about it. Okay. Um. Thank you. And I'll just add, too, private companies have libraries. State legislatures have libraries. It's amazing the number of institutions that have libraries. Every news service in operation has a number of librarians that they have on their staff. Um, so it's, there are all sorts of career possibilities in library science. Um, I think what I'll do now is introduce the next three um, together, because they're all going to talk about aspects 
of public history, uh, museum work, uh, tour guides, uh, working in these kind of living history museums, working for various institutions that are trying to present history uh, to the larger public. So the three people who will be speaking about aspects of public history, um, as well as um, Brooke, Brooke is going to talk very briefly about, about a volunteer opportunity as well, um, are Helen Shoemaker, who is a professor um, in the history department specializing in public history and U.S. social history. Uh, Brooke Hathaway, who is a Miami history grad, uh, year of uh, graduation year 2010, who works currently at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati as a project manager for strategic initiatives, a position that she took in February. Uh, prior to getting this job, she taught in Baltimore with Teach for America, so, so she'll talk briefly about that as well, and worked as a project manager for the Greater Cincinnati Energy Alliance. And then the third person is Kate Ely, a Miami history grad uh, from 2011, who works for the Cincinnati Museum Center as a programming specialist in the Museum of Natural History and Science, where she writes and researches environmental history programs, among many other things. Uh, and currently, she's writing a program about the Dust Bowl, which intersects with her senior honors thesis, uh, which, she, which she defended in the spring of 2011. So talk about putting your, <laughs> your research to work. So I'll turn it over to Professor Shoemaker first. So um, I first have a question. How many of you have interned, had a job, or done anything at a museum? Any? Okay, a fair number. I want you to fill out this blue sheet, kind <laughs> of creating a display. We want to start presenting some of that. So that's the first thing. The second is um, I teach the Introduction to Public History course, which is a 200-level class. And I also teach the public history um, uh, seminar at the 400 level. Those are the two courses that we have that are explicitly public history. Public history is museums. It also work, um, does archive and library science and community work. So it's kind of the broad umbrella. Um, I have a handout, um, like all good faculty, and I'm going to put the handout over on the table. It's also a yellow sheet just to complicate matters. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that public history is about experience, it's about scholarship, and it's about working with the public. Many of the skills that you're developing in your history classes not only go directly into museum work, but they also tangentially are the things that you can build on. So you have specific research skills, you also have presentation skills, and you have analytical skills. Museum work, there. Um, just today there was a um, a kind of satire of the best public history graduate program ever. And their workshops varied because some people probably have worked at very small museums on how to clean a toilet, all the way to how to fundraise, all the way to how to do an exhibition. And that pretty much covers the gamut, I think. So I'm going to stop there because we have two people who are recent grads who are working in the museums, who, by the way, did not take my classes because I wasn't teaching them at the time, um, so I can't take a single iota of anything. Um, so I don't want to say, like, if you take my class, you get to work there. Um, but I did want to just sort of let you know who I am. If you did an internship or anything, I'd love you to fill out this, because we want to create a display. And if you're interested in more information, I've got lots of web links and a, a condensed version of the American Historical Association, which has a book on doing public history as a career. Most of you, if you have a BA in history and you're inclined this way, are already prepared to get entry-level jobs in this field. So that's one thing. The other is that master's degrees are often a way to move up in the field, but they aren't necessarily a requirement. It depends on the institution you're at. So I'm going to turn it over to, oh, do you need it? No, no, no. To Brooke. Oh, that's right. He did all of it. All right, um, I am Brooke Hathaway. I work at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. I am a project manager for strategic initiatives, which is a mouthful um, for a title, but I work in the contemporary side of the museum. Um, so my museum has obviously four walls and does an entire guest experience when you walk in. I have nothing to do with that. I d my department takes what we do in the museum and tries to take it to a national and an international level. So that's what my work is in. Um, the Freedom Center is a museum on the Underground Railroad, slavery, and contemporary slavery. So my work is 90% having to do with modern-day slavery and human trafficking. 
Um, I never thought that I would be in public history. Um, I thought that I would either be in law school, um, and I was very interested in social justice, which still makes sense because, again, I'm still on the more contemporary side of things. Um, and so that's how I kind of ended up at the Freedom Center. I was in Teach for America, um, so I would be more than happy to answer any questions on Teach for America. Um, I will warn you that I left the program after a year because I did not like it. Um, so I will also be very honest if you have any concerns. Um, Tatiana wrote my recommendation letter for that program and also counseled me on that. Um, and she also wrote my recommendation letter. I'm a grad student right now at UC doing my master's at night. So if you have questions also on graduate school, I can attempt to answer that. Um, but my role at the Freedom Center and what has prepared me most from the history side of things, um, obviously the degree and the research skills that you get, I don't think I ever understood how many of the skills that we gain as history majors weren't universal to everybody. Um, right where we can read quickly, we can research, we can write. And those aren't things that all of our colleagues have. Um, and I just never really understood that, and that has come to be a huge advantage that I've had in any of the, the places I've been. Um, so play that up. I would also really recommend, um, like she said, interning in as many places as possible. I never interned in a museum. I interned in a press office on the Hill um, and several other different places, and those are where I got skills that set me apart from other museum professionals. So I had communication skills. I had PR skills. I had um, things that not other museum students had necessarily. So diversify the types of experiences that you're getting. Um, my other recommendation would be um, public speaking and communication courses. Um, one, like she said, you do a lot of development. So even though I am not in the development department, which is totally responsible for fundraising, in the public history type of things, um, you have to do a ton of development. So I'm pitching why you know somebody should give a million dollars to why somebody should become a member for fifteen dollars like the entire gamut so as much um, communications courses as you can take um, and especially in persuasive type of things is very helpful um, I think that's it I did say that I have um, volunteer opportunities. That's what I had originally got in contact with. So if anybody is interested in internships, I have several different types that I can talk to you about for this summer. Um, and we also have a docent class that's coming through the Freedom Center. So docents at the museums are volunteers that give tours to the public. And that's how a lot of museums operate. Um, and we rely heavily on those volunteers. And so the Freedom Center is um, looking for another group of volunteers interested in doing that. So if you're also interested um, it would be a little bit of a drive from Miami, of course, about an hour. But for one or two days a week, it would really add to your resume. So, thank you. All right, my turn. Um, hi, my name is Kate Ely. I graduated um, in 2011, and I work in the Museum of Natural History and Science at the Museum Center downtown. Um, my job is actually a lot different than Brooks, and I think that's probably pretty common. When it comes to museums, you're not going to just have one thing that you're going to be doing all the time. Brooke does a lot of different and diverse things um, over at the Freedom Center, and I do kind of maybe a little bit of the opposite that she does. I'm more in the education um, realm of the museum, so I write all of the environmental and some of the science programming that we do in the Natural History Museum. Um, I basically half my day is sitting upstairs in my office researching potential programs, um, rewriting programs that other people have written, um, basically doing a lot of writing, which she said. Um, that's probably one of the biggest things you can do, one of the biggest skills you get out of being a history major is the ability to read, write, edit, and uh, do it well and do it quickly. Um, I definitely read a lot. I do a lot of kind of various research topics. Um, I also work a lot with adult volunteers and youth volunteers in the museum. And I spent three and a half years at Miami in a service fraternity. I was the president my senior year. And that really gave me an edge as well. Um, I love working with guys your age and um, high school kids. All our youth volunteers are in high school. And um, a lot of my day is spent working with them to um, showing them how to do demos and um, interpretation of the exhibit and things like that. So um, I again I do all kinds of things. Research, um, 
I do presentations. I'm running a class on Saturday for members of the museum on the four ancient Indians and uh, their contribution into the environment. So it's a lot of diverse things, which is great if you're like me and super ADD and don't like to do one thing all the time. Um, it's a great job to have. Cool. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Give Chris a proper introduction. Um, our, our fifth panelist uh, is Chris Hines, who is a Miami history grad uh, from 2008. Uh, and he's a certified public consultant. I learned what, it, what CPC stands for. Um, and an executive recruiter and account manager for Randstad Engineering, which is the second largest staffing organization in the world. Um, and it specializes in providing HR services to companies of all sizes. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Okay. First off, uh, I want to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and Career Services. This is an opportunity I've actually really been waiting for because if any of you are like me and my Van Wilder S collegiate career here, five year history major, yes, I'll admit it, um, I really just kind of bounced around to find my own way. Uh, came in as a zoology major for three semesters. Uh, you can thank OCHEM for that switch. Uh, I um, switched, over to, switched over to business, um, kind of moved around in there. And actually, it was, uh, if any of you have taken business courses, BLS 342, which is business law, that actually uh, attracted me into the legal realm of things. So the research and presentation skills were where I needed to hone down. So I came into the College of Arts and Sciences as a history major. And that had to be the last move because I think that was my second semester junior year. So I had to wrap things up at some point. But um, as mentioned, I work for uh, Ronstadt. Ronstadt is a, is a $22 billion uh, provider of global HR services and staffing for a multitude of industries. Uh, HR services in and of itself is the fast, one of the fastest growing sectors of global industry with a global market value of upwards of $300 billion. Um, for a consult and it's certified personnel consultant, not to uh, th throw anybody out, but um, yes, <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's all, that's all right. Um, but uh, aside from just doing full cycle recruiting for companies from small private health companies up to Fortune 200 global leaders of industry, uh, provide consultative services to those companies as well. One of my areas specializing is uh, bridging generational gaps in the workforce. There's a huge line in the sand drawn between the baby boomer generation that's retiring and the up and coming millennial generation. And one of the big problems out in industry is people not being able to identify with the other. So I work with companies to develop comprehensive HR programs and initiatives to kind of bridge those gaps and you know, build a unified workforce. Um, uh, I was a history major. Um, I was also a member of the Delta Chi fraternity here in Miami. Played water polo for the club water polo team. Um, I have lots and lots of information that I would love to throw at you guys because if there's anything I want you to walk away from tonight, it's a sense of, uh, I guess, peace of mind that know it's going to be okay. Um, I've been in recruiting for over five years. I had no idea the recruiting industry existed when I graduated. My sister, who's 10 months younger than me, graduated from Miami here with an engineering degree. Uh, she had a recruiter. Uh, contact her to uh, try to find her a job and uh, turned to me one day and said, uh, Christopher, I don't really know what the heck this guy does, but sounds like something you'd be good at. And I was like, okay, great. Defined career path right there. But um, yeah, that's, uh, again, this is an area that I'm very passionate about. I've got a wealth of knowledge I'd love to talk to you about and give you a kind of peace of mind on anything that you guys are concerned about. Um. And uh, just to close up the panel part of the evening, I just want to add um, a couple of things about government employment or government service, if you're interested in that. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, so if you're interested in the Peace Corps, which not only is a fantastic to your experience, but it's also a great um, set of experiences that you can bring to, um, to the job market uh, after you're out of it. And uh, I actually had a very, very good experience in the Peace Corps, so I can speak uh, glowingly about that and I can talk to you about the application process and about some of the skills that you might want to get now if you would like to be uh, a Peace Corps volunteer. And I also wanted to add uh, two other uh, professions that you might not immediately think of, 
but uh, several former students of mine uh, work for the government. Uh, one works for the FBI. The FBI is very interested in people with research skills for obvious reasons. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're interested in criminal investigation, that um, that is a career that is absolutely interested in history majors. And then the second one is if you're interested in working for the U.S. State Department, especially if you're interested in working overseas in one of our embassies, a very good friend of mine, I'm actually going to go visit him. He's in the U.S. Embassy in Kampala, Uganda right now. And he was a history major. And he said that, you know, probably 25% of the people he meets in the Foreign Service were history majors or history minors, in part because the Foreign Service exam uh, asks a lot of history questions on it, and in part because um, the Foreign Service is interested in people who um, have a, a wide geographic knowledge and are very curious about other places, which is something that a lot of history majors uh, fulfill. So if you're interested in the Foreign Service, I could actually put you in touch with him, and he would be more than happy uh, to talk about that. So what's going to happen is um, in, in just a little bit, we'll transition. I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Career Services, and they have some, some um, kind of worksheets and skill building things and, and exercises to do to help you think about the skills that you have. But while we have all of our panelists here, because Professor Sejas has to leave shortly, um, I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions uh, for any of the panelists right now. I know, I know. <laughs> Who's done the reading? <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Kyle. I have a question for Professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, I've read up a lot about urban education and CFA computers, so I'm just curious if you could share your perspective on the programs. Yeah, absolutely. Can we have oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you can hear me, but um, so. TFA, my, my caution for you. So what happened with me, I graduated in 10. The economy was terrible. Um, I was in Luxembourg in my senior year and was like, what am I going to do? So I just applied on a whim. And then the more and more, like the further I got into it, I decided like, oh, this is pretty competitive and pretty prestigious. I think I'm going to do this, which it was. The year I went in, less than 10% got in. I was so proud that like, yeah, I'm from Miami and these Harvard kids didn't get in. Like I was so excited. Um, what I would caution is simply that you you make sure that you're doing it not because it's simply the only job out there like it was when I was graduating and not simply because it's prestigious but make sure that you have a heart to teach and if you have that then it's going to be difficult it's going to be a crazy two years but you will be fine for me I got into it for the wrong reasons um, and did my year and then was comfortable leaving so just make sure that what you're passionate about lines up you'll be challenged you'll probably question that that was the right move um, most of my friends in Baltimore um, right we came from all over um, only a few of us didn't do year two by opting out um, so if you if you have a desire to teach then I say absolutely go for it um, but just make sure that you want to teach make sure like I love children, but I'm much better like working with high school age. I was in an elementary classroom and I had come from history and all of a sudden I was teaching kids how to read. I did not know, you know, I simply didn't have the passion for it. Um, so that's my only caution is to just make sure that that's what you want to do. Yeah. And if you have questions about the application process and stuff, I'd be happy to talk about that too. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yes, applying to uh, a degree in library sciences is as, to a certain extent, competitive as getting into law school, right? Because you want to get into a program that will make it possible for you to get a job, right? There are a lot of uh, universities that give you a master's in library sciences. Um, that don't have the cachet to be able to land you a good job. So there is an actual list of universities that I've put together that I recommend my students apply to. And most of those universities are also places where they can get uh, a master's in history at the same time. Because if you want to go into 
uh, working at a research university, like working at a university like at Ohio State, um, you know, a place where you help scholars do their work and you keep, uh, where you're responsible for large collections, you can distinguish yourself by having a master's in history. And so there are only so many programs across the country that allow you to do that. And one of the nice things about going for the, both the master's in history and the master's in library, in library sciences is that you can oftentimes get a fellowship from the history part of it um, by being a TA, right, a teaching assistant. Um, Library science is like law school, you have to pay for it. <laughs> so thinking about ways that you can get through the program without having to go into debt, I think is really important. So I think maybe for you, you should email me and I, can, I am happy to kind of look at the schools that you're applying to and um, help you craft your, you know, your personal statement um, to fit um, what I know universities want and um, to have you really start thinking about the possibility of doing a double master's because I think that is something that people think is undoable and it's actually really doable and it's a way for you to not have to pay for the master's in library sciences um, and I've had a couple of my students do that and I have one of our honor students um, is doing that right now she's thinking about applying to double programs because she wants to work at like an Ohio State or at, you know, Bloomington, at Un Indiana University. So I guess there are lots of ways about going, you know, ways of going about it. Um, if you want to be a librarian that works um, in a, you know, in a small town, um, you apply to different schools, right, to get that kind of a job. So I think that that is more that's something that you can, you know, really talk to one of us, especially me, because <laughs> I've, I've done this a lot. And I can tell you exactly what kind of programs you should be looking into. <laughs> All right. Um, well, to to be able to teach at a university level, right, you need a PhD in history, and um, it is incredibly, almost seemingly impossible to get into PhD programs nowadays. Um, it is also an incredible time commitment of your life, right? It's looking at ten years uh, of being in the university. And, and then having the reality of very likely not finding a job. There are so many positions at universities across the country, and unless you come out of a top tier university, you will not get a job. And that's just a reality. So um, I say to you if, you, if you can't imagine doing anything else, um, then there are ways that we can support you, right? The faculty um, can tell you what universities you should apply to. But um, you have to be really realistic, right? Um, unless you have an incredibly high GPA and are scoring at the top tier of the GRE um, and are willing to go to school for a very long time for a possibility of not getting a job, um, college teaching, um, is not uh, really something that I recommend for most of our majors. Um, my job has come to be convincing our smartest uh, students to not even consider graduate school. Um, yeah, <laughs> right, because I think I gave that speech to Brooke <laughs> 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 at one point. <laughs> um, 
that said, um, if you have that passion, and I know that there's one person in this room who I'm supporting 100%, um, but that's because I've had this conversation with her, and I think she does have the grades and everything else that will allow her to go to a top school. And she has promised to stick it out <laughs> and not think about the job at the end, right? So uh, there are many ways that you can teach. Actually, being a college professor is about a third teaching, right? Uh, most of what you do is research and writing and actually doing the work of history. Um, in terms of somebody who's thinking about the classics, um, you going into a classics program have to be proficient in Greek and Latin. So, you know, that's something that keeps a lot of people away. <laughs> um, and classics programs are closing across the country. So, you know, that's something that unless you talk to your professors one-on-one, -on -one, um, you don't even know what you're getting into. Um, so I urge all of you to meet with your professors. Um, there's no other way that we can talk to you individually. We can't make appointments with you, right? You have to make appointments with us. So I think that's something that I urge every one of you to do, to reach out to one of us. Mm -hmm. And most of us aren't in this room, right? Dr. DeBoer has joined us tonight. Um, some, you know, Helen, Eric, and I are here, but there are all kinds of other professors in this department who are very committed to helping our majors be successful, and whatever that means, whether you want to, you know, work for industry, want to work for government, want to pursue this job that we have, which really is incredible. We are so fortunate. Um, to be able to have the privilege to teach you and to write history. But for all of us, it's been a really long road. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think you have to have it in you to want to do that above anything else because you will be somebody who ends up getting a job in a town you've never even known about. Speaking of me, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm somebody from Mexico. I went to school in New York. I commuted to New Haven for graduate school. I had never even conceptualized Ohio until <laughs> I had th this wonderful opportunity to have a job here. And, um, it took going to Columbia and Yale to get a job here. So I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your head because it's a reality that nobody wants to talk about, but it's true. Um, I was going to say I, I put it akin to you study ballet for 15 years and then you don't get a job or you study the cello and you play in the local symphony. Like it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. and. Um, I, I would second many, most all the comments. Um, the, the, one of the great challenges is that the very fields like classics are actually closing and that's unlikely to change no matter how upsetting and angering that is. Um, it, it, it is like that and you wanted to... Well, so I was just going to say that um, I faced that question, not in classics, but I went to her and she gave me that exact spiel. And I left very like, oh my gosh, like I feel like this is what I want to do with my life and now I don't know what I'm going to do, right? Um, and this was before I was working at the museum that I'm currently at. Um, and so I just want to encourage you that I have two classmates from my year that are in their PhD program, so what year four of that, um, and they're on the road. So it can be done. So, mm -hmm. right? Just it caution, take all of this advice and know that it, it's a difficult road. But it can be done if that's what you want to do and just stay passionate with it. However, another option and the one that I decided to go for um, was to do a master's degree for two years to see if this is what I want. Um, and so that master's degree, right, and then I got the job too, so I'm doing it at night. Um, but I'm not doing public history for my master's degree in history. I'm doing... Um, U.S. history at University of Cincinnati. And so try that. That's another option is um, selecting a master's school and to see if that's really what you want to do. But then the same problems exist. Like you have to be in the top tier. You're going to have to, you're going to have to prove yourself in that master's program in order to possibly apply to a PhD program afterwards. 
but that's another option if that's what you're interested in. And like my program has 13 or 14 people. They're teaching because they're TAs. They're fully funded, so they're not going into debt to get that master's degree. Um, and most of them are doing it full time. Uh, just one very, very quick piece of advice on the topic of graduate schools is do, if, if you're thinking of, of pursuing a PhD in history, do not go to any program that does not give you a full ride. Do not go into debt for this. Um, I mean, one of the nice things about getting a PhD in the arts and sciences is most departments will, they'll fund a certain number of students, so you don't have to go into debt. Do not take out a loan to do this because it's just too great a risk that you won't get uh, a job that'll help you pay it back. So, um, so keep that in mind. Um, I actually have a question for our three uh, recent uh, alums. Uh, I'm curious about the job interview, and I'm wondering at what point or if uh, the interviewer asked you about your history major and what kinds of things they were interested in and what you told them about what skills your history major provided you with that made you perfect for the job. Maybe I'll start with Chris if you're ready for this. Nice. I do get a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is anybody going into business or doing something not higher education? Um, yes. Started majors in two other majors, right? Yes. It like you would have a. Yes. Like the history major did. I've been everywhere. I can tell you all about Miami. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, actually, um, it, the line of. Sorry. I'm sorry. I have to go to something very important. I promise. I swear. Um, but please, um, I meant it when I when I asked you to email me and come talk to me, and and not just me, but all of your professors. Um, and have a good, informative rest of the evening. I am off. Um, I'll start off, uh, so coming back to the interview and about my history major. Um, to be honest with you, my history major is not something that's purposefully seeked out by the types of companies that I work for, but I can also tell you the vice president of sales for my company, which of Ronstadt, a $22 billion company, we're $150 million opco and the fastest operating company, fastest growing operating company. Both the vice president of sales and the president of this operating company are both history majors from their schools. Um, in the line of work that I do, and I think you're hearing a, a common denominator here that a lot of the tangible skills of being able to research uh, extract data, present that data, create value for whoever needs that data is probably some of the top skill sets that you're going to learn in the College of Arts and Sciences. I did take Helen's 400 level class <laughs> and spent quite a bit of time in Oxford Library archives researching Harry Toby. Um, if you don't know who he is, I... just got a designation. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as, uh, I was going to say, if you, don't know who, if you don't know who Harry Toby is, I probably didn't do that good a job. But she passed me, thankfully. But I'll tell you, um, there is just, as you know, I mean, we live in, in a day age where data and information is gold. And companies need to be able, in near real time, pull in data, mine it, ex and extract value, like I said, and get that back out. It's what provides a competitive advantage to any organization in any, any industry in any line of work. Um, so those skills tangibly are going to be great skills that I encourage you to work on. Um, in the interview process, you know, I didn't really specifically sell my history major, but I sold the skill sets that it taught me. What I do is basically, um, as a recruiter and account manager, I find top talent for top companies. And there's a lot of people out there. So I have to go about very strategically finding um, information, finding people, uh, you know, opening those lines of communications, basically marrying that perfect candidate to a good company. Um, and my ability in a highly competitive and fastest growing, in, in fast growing industry like uh, recruiting, um, I have to be able to do that quickly, efficiently, and in a manner that uh, allows my clients to see me as credible. Um, at the end of the day, I've, I've relocated families across the country being nothing more than a voice over the phone. 
Um, one of the great things about Miami University is you have so much opportunity and a close-knit university where developing interpersonal communication skills are absolutely essential in the real world. Your, what you do, your resume is not going to get you a job. I don't want to say that the things you do that you put on your resume aren't important, but your ability to articulate your experiences and the things that you've gained, the skills you've gained from what's on your resume is what companies want to hear. I've always recruited highly technical skill sets. Um, I started in the scientific division of a previous company, uh, do a lot of work in regulated industry, uh, pharmaceutical biotech. I've placed Miami alumni that were engineers, um, microbiology majors, school um, supply chain operations management, I've, and I'm working with three more right now from a couple other schools. Um, I love that Miami pedigree because I know I send a Miami alumni into an interview that they're going to be able to identify, build rapport, and articulate their experiences. Because at the end of the day, a company isn't going to hire somebody that's a total brainiac or a subject matter expert in their field, put them in a closet with a bunch of money and say, have fun, come back out when you've got a new invention or something. Um, so companies want people that they like at the end of the day. And um, if you can create that value as somebody that I, and this is very important as an entry level person graduate from college because you're not going to have that experience. I hear it all the time. Well, how am I going to get that experience if nobody gives me a job and gives me a chance? Well, you know, you've got to get your foot in the door. I always tell people be honest about or confident about what you know, honest about what you don't. But you can always reinforce with companies in any, this goes for any industry, not just, you know, business, but you can reinforce with them that uh, your work ethic, your ability to catch on, that those are the intangible things that are going to help provide an ROI for them giving you a chance. Um, and at the end of the day, companies want to hire people they like. I would rather hire somebody that's coming in at a lower price point that I can stand to train for eight hours a day and be around them that long, investing my time, versus somebody that's coming at a higher price point, they're a subject matter expert, I've probably got to break down their bad habits or previous mindsets of doing business to retrain them my way. Um, so, you know, like I said before, if you walk away from anything tonight, walk away with peace of mind that you do have marketable skill sets coming out with a history degree, with the intangible things that Miami can teach you. I forgot to mention, I minored, I minored in decision sciences and entrepreneurship here too, um, which is kind of funny because I suck at math. I think I got a D plus in calculus here. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll admit it. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the five credit hour D sucks on your GPA too. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, again, it's back to that we're in the information age and, um, you know, being able to see trends and data go in and mine that and w with little to no direction, but there's a lot of direction out there. But, again, the speed at which you can do that and the ways you articulate things, uh, the interpersonal communication skills coupled with the research skills, um, and the analytical skills that you develop in the College of Arts and Sciences are absolutely essential to any job in any industry. And, um, you know, that's where companies need uh, strong people that are motivated to have success for their organizations. So. All right. Um, I will be perfectly honest with you. I did not find a job right away after college. Um, I, like Brooke, graduated at, like, probably the worst possible every time um, to find a job. I spent about six months in the job that I've held um, over the summer um, since my senior year of high school, which was great. Um, it gave me a lot of time to kind of look for stuff. And then I spent a year in as a membership manager at the museum center before I had got my uh, current job. So when they hired me for um, the natural history and science job. I had already worked at the museum for about a year. I did something totally different, um, but it kind of gave me definitely a foot in the door, if um, nothing else. Um, my interview for my first job, my membership job, um, they asked me a lot of, again, customer service and um, 
communication related questions, which I still use every single day in my natural history and science job. Um, I talk to the public daily, be it a two-year-old that comes to play in the sandbox and is doing a little science exper experiment with me, or a 70-year-old who remembered Union Terminal when it was still a train station um, back in the day. So I talk to a huge variety of people from all different backgrounds, um, all different kinds of walks of life. So it's important to be able to communicate and get on a one-on-one -on -one basis with whoever you're talking to. Um, they also were really interested, since I work for a science museum, why as a history major, I wanted to work in a science museum. And luckily, I have always had two loves, um, one which has been history. And I've always known, since I was a little, little child, that I wanted <laughs> to be a history major in college and study history. But I also love, love, love science. And I've always loved science. I took a lot of science um, classes here especially in um, botany and um, geology, which are kind of my other areas of interest. So um, I was able to kind of merge those two together for my job, which is really important since I write all of the environmental and sustainability programs that they run at the museum. That's probably the one thing I can tell you too. Not everyone's gonna have like a second passion that they just are really gung-ho about. If you do, share it. and be really excited about it because it's definitely going to give you, especially history and science are pretty two diverse fields, um, it's going to give you an edge when you go into the interview process. So any kind of experiences that you had, customer service, um, again, another passion that you have is going to be worth talking about, I think. Yeah. Okay, um, well I've had three different major positions um, and so interviewing for the three of them um, I think gives a wide variety of like how to leverage the history degree. So for Teach for America, um, Teach for America is really interested in time management skills and in organization skills. So like I remember sitting in the interview, the campus was closed here, it was snowing and I had to like walk over to Western in order to interview for this. Um, and they were asking like, so how do you manage, you know, manage your time? And I'm a very organized person and I like tell them like, my planner. So like is it color coded? And like they wanted to know full on details of how organized. So if you're interested in Teach for America, like time management. And seriously that's a huge piece while you're there. Um, they did a Google calendar training for us because it was like all about how overwhelmed you're going to be and like you need to be able to manage your time. So if you're interested in Teach for America, like history degree, I was like, oh, well when I'm writing my thesis, right, like I had to schedule out when I had to be in research here and I was doing it while studying in Luxembourg so then I had to Skype over to Tatiana and then I had to do X, Y, and Z. So you can totally talk about if you're doing research and if you're doing a thesis, um, the ability to leverage and juggle all of these different projects. Um, and all of the abilities in order to organize your research notes. So, oh hey, I wrote a 150 page research paper that required X amount of hours of research. How did I manage that? Well, I had this binder and it did blah, 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 blah. So like you can flip everything that you're doing and illustrate a lot of these different points. Um, the second job after I left teaching um, was for a project manager for an energy efficiency nonprofit. I did not care about energy efficiency. Um, but I was trying to get into the nonprofit work of the Freedom Center, so I took another nonprofit job. So project management is all about, um, right, and my title still today is project manager. Um, project management is all about organizing and managing and motivating other people. So in history, how was I able to do that? Once again, how are you able to manage time, documents, um, research, papers, all of these different components, and how can you bring it together to an end project? So, once again, if you're writing a thesis, that's definitely the first piece of work that I still submit as a writing sample for any type of job, and it's now like three and a half years old, and definitely doesn't reflect my best writing anymore, but it shows that I'm able to research and that I'm able to put together thoughts, complex thoughts, and an argument. Um, but again, so project management, like talk about how you leverage and juggle all of these different <coughs> research abilities, databases. Um, the database thing, and I think that's something that we've all talked about, is again, like I said before, not a skill that everybody has. Like even things as far as looking on Google for sources and stuff are not things, right, to us they seem natural and easy. Not everybody knows how to do that well. So even in my interns now that I supervise, my history interns are significantly better at looking up 
news searches for me than somebody coming from the communications department or somebody, I mean, from wherever, not to like put anybody under the bus, but history just has significantly better research skills. And I think that that wasn't something that I realized because that came so natural because we're trained to do that, um, that you don't realize that you can sell it and that that's definitely a strength of yours. Um, and then going into my latest job at the Freedom Center, right, that's definitely um, the position that's most related to the history major. Um, and I think that what came through there, and if you're interested in public history, um, is your passion. So like I could talk about how the subject matter of my, his, of my museum that I work for is what was what excited me. Like that's what mattered to me. So I could use my failed experience in Teach for America, which people told me was going to be a black mark on my resume because I left it early. And I was like, well, I'm going to show you. Um, but then you can take that and you can say, like, that's not my passion, but, like, my passion is doing this type of social justice work. And look at the research that I've done. Look at all the different pieces I've done. Look how I can leverage this. And they're going to they're gonna see that. They could, they interview other candidates and they're going to tell that what you're passionate about. So that's why I keep going back to returning to, if you want to go and get your PhD, do it. They're going to see that passion. If you want to go and work in business, I mean, just follow where you feel you're led because that's what is going to light up your eyes and they're going to be able to tell. So. Other questions? Okay, I just wanted to add something really quickly. I wanted to pick up on, on, on something that Chris had mentioned, uh, just to echo it a little bit. Uh, several years ago, uh, several, a bunch of corporations from the Cincinnati area came, and they organized a meeting just with College of Arts and Sciences uh, faculty and um, kind of career advisors. And they said something that, that, that Chris had just said in, in his presentation, and that is, they said, look, we're interested in graduates of the Farmer School of Business, absolutely. But what we find is that in some situations, we have to untrain them of what they learned, you know, the Farmer School of Business way, and then retrain them in our particular, like, sort of corporate culture way. And they said that we don't have to do that with, with um, arts and sciences majors, humanities majors, uh, people like uh, uh, history majors. Um, you guys come in with critical thinking skills, great research skills, great organizational skills, fantastic writing skills, and you don't come in with this like preconceived notion of like, here's how we do marketing, or here's how we do, you know, uh, X, Y, or Z. And they said that was actually um, a plus for a lot of, of CAS majors. So um, just as a, one last confidence booster, just keep in mind companies and organizations, uh, nonprofit uh, agencies, government agencies, museums, lots and lots of institutions out there are very interested in the skills that you have. Um, I wanted to add too, like the, the panelists will be sticking around, we're going to have a reception afterwards and they'll be happy to answer questions uh, on an individual basis. Uh, but right now I want to turn it over to Mary Beth Barnes from Career Services uh, to talk you through some very specific uh, exercises. Thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. In the interest of time, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, as Eric mentioned, I'm Mary Beth Barnes, and I'm your career advisor for the College of Arts and Science, um, Social Science and Humanities majors. I already see some familiar faces out there, so I know that I've been meeting with many of you, and it's been great to get to know you over these past few months as history majors. I want to give you a little bit of a background on career services. I know that many of you, as I mentioned, have made yourself aware of our services, but if you don't know a lot, a lot of our services, I'm going to go over that. And I also want to go over our newly enhanced website. We've got some really wonderful, very robust um, mechanisms for you to search careers and to answer all the questions that you might have relative to resume writing, interviewing, and all the different services that Career Services has. I know someone mentioned Western Campus earlier, so if you, don't, if you do or you don't know, Career Services is on Western Campus. We're just a five-minute walk from the Shriver Center. 
So in Hoyt. So if you don't get over to Western too often, we encourage you to come and visit us in, in Hoyt. And that is where all of our services are located and our career advisors are located. We also, being your career advisor for the College of Arts and Science, I have satellite locations. So I'm also located in Harrison. If that is convenient for you, I know some of you have met me in Harrison. Um, I'm in Harrison, room 214 on Mondays and Wednesdays, and I'm in the psychology building. So if you are a psychology, well, we wouldn't have any minors, but if you do take any classes or if that becomes a, a familiar place for you to go, you can meet with me in the psychology building. So we definitely want to make sure that we're accessible to you all throughout campus. So if you can't visit me in Hoyt, please come and see me in our other satellite locations. I also want to mention as it comes to pertains to our satellite locations, we do drop-in resume reviews. So if you have developed a resume, or if you're after tonight, you're ready to go and get your resume started and get that developed, you can have one of our career advisors, one of our, and he, is, yes. <laughs> Actually, one of your fellow majors is one of our career advisors. And so we have a group of excellent career advisors who are well-trained to review resumes in Hoyt and all throughout campus. Are you in Hoyt, Deidre? You're OD. All for some diversity fair. So we have other locations outside of um, academic facilities and some of the other locations all throughout campus. So if you're curious about where to do those office hours or where to go and get a resume review, if you just go to our homepage, and under the student tab, you'll see those resume drop-in hours. And each, each department has different hours. Now, in Hoyt, we're available 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. But on our sa other satellite locations, um, career advisors have certain hours. And you don't need an appointment. So you can come and meet with me as, a, as your career advisor through an appointment that you can make through our website, as you can see right there. A, a, a term you want to become familiar with, if you aren't already, is Miami Career Link. How many of you have a, an account on Miami Career Link? Great. So I encourage you all to go out and develop an account, and that's an awesome place where you'll go and schedule your, your um, advising appointments. No appointment is necessary for, to meet with a career advisor, but if you do feel more comfortable making an appointment, you can make an appointment to, meet, to have a mock uh, to do a resume review. Um, now, I mentioned Miami Career Link, so I'll talk about that. So if you can go and, go and set up your account on Miami Career Link, that's the place where you can make appointments with career advisors and also mock interviews. We have an excellent mock interview program on campus where we have students and community members. We actually have a community member who does um, interviews for students who are interested in consulting careers on Wednesday afternoons. So we have those all available to you. So if you'd like to come and do a mock interview, and even if it's for a job or an internship or even a, a, a community service event on campus or if you're applying to be one of our, to a sole leader or anything like that, we can give you some experience with a mock interview. So and you can sign up for mock interviews on Miami Career Link as well. So just, and besides that, you can research companies and, and look at job postings. Many companies post jobs and inter internships through Miami Career Link. So as you're searching for those opportunities, I encourage you to seek that out. Other resources available to you, we offer EDL classes. So those are classes if you feel like you really need some more assistance in resume writing or you really want to explore careers more, have a more focused session, taking one of our EDL classes is an excellent resource for you as well. On our website, I also want to make you familiar with, if I can reach over there, these links. So it pertains to your job search and your internship, internship search. These division-specific and related interest searches will be an excellent resource for you to look at different career job opportunities. So I'll show you, just for example, if you would like to go to under the College of Arts and Sciences. You'll see we have a, just a multitude of related interest areas depending on what you might like to, to go into. So, for example, we'll, we'll dial down. And we do have a tab for history. So if you'd like to see some of the different options as far as different career paths, different internship opportunities, associations that you might like to research, companies, it's a very robust site, so you'll see as you scroll down, there's so many links available to you. So if you're not really sure what you can do with your major, this might be a really great place to look to see all the different job opportunities, internship opportunities that are available. As it also caters to interest areas, so I'll back up from that. And so if you're interested in, say, um, social justice, I know as Brooke, social justice and nonprofits. So there's an area for social justice and nonprofits. So if you go down, so through that link, we'll also provide a lot of different um, excellent resources to job links and internship resources. So has anybody had a chance to look at this site? Some, some people have? Okay, great, great. We really encourage you. We spent a lot of time in developing these. We worked with faculty and staff all throughout campus to learn about 
where um, to find careers or opportunities or ways to connect within your fields. So this will be an excellent resource for you that I hope that you definitely utilize. And as I mentioned, you don't necessarily have to, to limit yourself. So if you're interested in, for example, wanting to get into the human resources field. So if you just go under Farmer's School of Business, we have a tab for human resources. So if you'd like to explore different uh, career paths or look at different jobs or internship opportunities, that's an excellent way for you to look at that as well. So definitely take some time and go through these and go through all the different links when you're looking at different resources that we have available. I also want to mention an important program that we just started this year. We're very excited about this program. It's called the Career Success Certificate. Has anybody already signed up for the certificate program yet? Not yet, okay. Well, I definitely want to encourage you. This is a, a program that we, we, we find is going to be very successful and really hope students can take advantage of it. If you are really looking, looking at really wanting to gain more marketable skills, uh, develop your resume, learn how to, to market yourself, and also just kind of make yourself really more confident when it pertains to your job search, this Career Success Certificate, and I brought some other handouts on this so you can take one if you're interested. This is an excellent program. Uh, you will get sort of a, we were looking at getting in some sort of a di digital badge that you can actually put on your resume and show to recruiters that you are definitely marketable and, and have the marketable skills that it, it takes to, to go out into the workforce. Um, a lot of the program if you look, we have all sorts of different workshops that you can take advantage of. Anything from our basic workshops like basic interviewing skills to uh, how to write a resume and cover letter to some very specific workshops that we have developed just for this program. One being building your advisory committee. Learn how to choose the people who can help you achieve your goals, serve as references, and advisors on your career journey. So if you are not really sure about who is in your network or how you want to go about searching careers, we've really got some excellent sessions that going after this career, career um, success certificate will give you those tools that you need to make you to feel confident as you go off into the job market. Another piece of this is attending our, our annual career fairs. So la obviously in September we had our, our fall career fair. It was a very successful event. I think uh, we had over 270 employers that came. And I just want to mention that we looked and over 100 of those employers were looking for students of all majors. So I think a common misconception is that the career fair is only for business majors and that is certainly not the case when over 100 uh, different companies and representatives and organizations are coming looking for students from diverse majors. So I definitely encourage you to seek out those opportunities when we have events like that on campus. Our next career fair will be Spring Ice and that's the Spring Internship and Career Fair. And it's going to be February 4th. So as we all know, that is going to be a short ramp up from when you get back from January t from, from the Jan term. So it's a week after school begins. So I encourage you, go ahead and start thinking about that, thinking about attending spring, uh, the spring ice event. Right now, I think we have almost 200 employers scheduled. And if you're thinking about a summer internship or looking at doing something over next fall or looking for a part-time job over the summer, this will be an excellent opportunity to come and talk with company representatives. I think Chris really alluded to this point earlier, it's, it, and everyone has talked about it tonight, it's so important that you really think about and are able to articulate those skills that you've gained through your degree program. I think you've seen some of the themes that have resonated, the research skills that you're all developing, the communication skills, the writing skills, able, being able to synthesize information. So you know a lot of these skills that you're developing, and we want to make sure that, as Miami students, you have those tools to articulate that at an event such as the career fair and the spring ice. So how many of you are familiar with the term the elevator pitch or the, uh, the, the one minute commercial? Okay, so a lot of you are, good, good. Well, we wanted to give you some tools. We wanted you to take, have something to take home with you tonight that can really help you hone in on what that really means to think about the skills that you're developing as a history major and those skills that you're developing outside of the classroom. I know a lot of our uh, alums here tonight talked about the other activities that they're involved in on campus, and certainly getting involved outside of your degree program is going to make you um, have more of those transferable skills and develop more skills that you'll need to be successful. So I'm going to turn it over now to Tyler Wade. He's a graduate student with, uh, in the, the SAHI program. That's the Student Affairs Higher Ed program here at Miami. And he has been working with Career Services and actually helped us develop this workbook. It's called Telling Your Story. And that's really what we want to give you the tools to do 
to tell your story and to be able to articulate those skills that you developed and give you a way to, uh, in a clear and concise manner, develop that, um, at the end of the day, that elevator pitch or that networking, what you're, how you're going to use when you're network with other individuals. So I know we're passing that around now. Any questions about the services offered through career, career services? Okay. Okay, very good. Well, at this point, I'll turn it over to Tyler, and he will uh, walk you through what this, uh, what this workbook is and how you can use it to, um, to develop your elevator pitch and really hone in more on what those um, transferable skills that you're developing will be. All right, how's everybody doing? Good? A lot of information. Were you excited? Good, good. Uh, and so, like uh, Mary Beth said, we put together this, this booklet called Telling Your Story to help you kind of think through a little bit of the skills that you gain both inside and outside of the classroom as a Miami student, uh, some of these things that will make you uh, a really attractive candidate to employers. And so if you open up into the front page of, of the booklet, um, each year the National Association of Colleges and Employers sends out a survey to different companies across the United States. And so uh, in that survey is a list of skills that they seek for in potential employees. And so You'll see there at the bottom of the inside page, 1 through 10, are these are the top 10 skills in 2013 that employers were looking for uh, in college graduates or folks that they're looking for. So you'll see formally communicating with persons inside and outside the organization, uh, working in a team situation, make decisions and solve problems, plan, organize, and prioritize work, obtain and process information, analyze quantitative data, technical knowledge related to the job, proficiency with computer software programs, create and or edit written reports, and sell or influence others. Uh, and just looking quickly through that list, one through 10, uh, as history majors specifically, do you see that there are any of those skills that really align well for the, the kinds of skills that you need to be successful as a history major? And anybody can answer. But. <laughs> yes, yes, which ones? <laughs> Yeah. But she's considering. But I think that's a good point. I think you can really speak to an arts and science degree, really, if you think about that, what these skills will be. Yeah. yeah. Well, like her, I'm history, but I'm also in um, IT. I feel like the history to analyze quantitative data is definitely, uh, I know with my other major, I work a lot more with the team. My test is with three other um, girls who work. But I feel like it kind of, when you kind of sell yourself, almost all of these are applicable to the history major. I feel like I honed my skills in both my majors and both of the Definitely, definitely. Also important to add, I, I, nobody probably possesses these skills one through, one through <coughs> ten, right? I think you would find anybody that's been in the profession uh, for, you know, five, ten years, they probably don't necessarily have all ten of these mastered. So even if there are one, two, three, or four of them that you think that uh, you might be able to talk about in an interview, that's going to be really, really good to get that step forward uh, and, and really separate you from different candidates uh, that are applying for jobs. Any other ones uh, specifically that you would say apply for history majors? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Chris, when you think about uh, looking at employees or for staffing purposes, would you say that one through ten list matches up well with some of the skills you find companies That's looking for? Document that I actually brought in on tangible skill sets, and it's worded differently, but it's identical. And these were uh, top ten most seeked out skill sets by companies hiring within the millennial generation, so pretty much the last ten years. And uh, again, while it's a tangible skill set, it's about being able to articulate your exposure to that skill set, how you used it, where you've had successes using it. So yeah. it becomes about this story. Mm -hmm. 
Definitely, definitely. And so uh, if you look through the rest of the booklet here, uh, the things that kind of walks you through this in a very step-by-step -step basis. And so we start out showcasing those 1 through 10 skills that employers seek out and then ask you to think a little bit about, and we're probably not going to have time to have everyone work all the way through it tonight, uh, but to think about, you know, what are those, some of those skills that you've acquired during your coursework here at Miami or maybe in a summer internship or a job that you've worked uh, back home. Uh, and then talk about ways that you can improve or demonstrate those skills uh, and, and then also think about, well, if I didn't come up with all of the skills, what are some things that I could seek out during my time at Miami to maybe add another one of those into my toolkit? And so, you know, one of the things that's listed in there is uh, computer software programs. Uh, there are so few people right now that are in the job force that know anything about being able to write code or being able to build websites for companies. And so if you can come up with any kind of experience in those things, you're going to be a really, really valuable employee. Um, and then when we go through those skills and ways that you can build them up, it also asks you to talk about what are some of the classroom skills. So maybe as a history major, but maybe through your Miami plan classes. Uh, some of our panelists talked about being interested in other uh, academic fields. So maybe that's something that they picked up a minor in. How can those skills uh, make you an attractive candidate? Uh, what are you involved in on campus? Are you the president of a club or organization? Are you in a fraternity or sorority? Um, I can't tell you how many times we talk to students that say, I don't really know how to talk about being uh, the social chair of my fraternity when I apply for a job, right? What would anybody, uh, why would anybody think that that's an attractive skill? And you think, well, you know, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know how to, you know how to manage people. Uh, you know how to be able to, to do risk management. You probably had a budget that you managed. You planned events. Those are all skills that you can talk about, just being able to parse it out in a way that's going to be clear and concise and is attractive for employers. And so what we kind of wanted to do tonight was to have you look at those those NACE skills. Think a little bit about what skills you have as a Miami student, both in history, in the classroom, and outside of the classroom, and start maybe sketching out that elevator speech. And so that's what's towards the back half of the book is you bump into someone like Chris in an elevator. You say, hey, I'm a student in Miami. He says, hey, look, I graduated from Miami. Um, how can you talk to Chris, talk to a potential employer, and say in a very succinct way, right, this is what I am. This is what I've done at Miami. This is something that I might be interested in in doing in a career. And so we wanted to give you about five to ten minutes or so to start sketching out some of the things that you might talk about in a potential elevator speech. And then once that time's over, we're going to have folks kind of pair up and maybe start to share that a little bit and give some feedback to each other. Um, any questions about that? There's a lot of information at once. Cool. So take five to ten minutes to start sketching out some of that, those skills uh, to build that elevator pitch.